locked in. Look at what we have here, folks. To the only show that matters. The cream of the crop. Duke loves wrestling. And there is no one that does it better than your host. I have come here to chew bubblegum and kick ass. The Duke. And I'm all out of bubblegum. S-A-W-F-T, soft! Yeah, you're soft, all right. Hey, hey. Soft as Enzo. How cool was that? Huh? Not very. Listen. Not very cool. Listen, when it comes to doing pro wrestler impersonations, I got to get a, a, some kind of standing ovation for that. I, for I mean, Come on, come on. For, for being what? awesome at it. No. All right? No. Nope. Awesome. Negative. Okay? Negative. Please. Well, Another we, week of negative. Listen. Oh, you, you're trying to sing now. Listen to this. No, guy. I can sing. Yeah. Right. I just I just don't give that away for free. Yeah. Don't quit like your the rest of my job. talent on this show. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Welcome back to Duke Loves Wrestling. I am the Duke. And yes, I do enjoy doing pro wrestling impersonations. I'm going to keep on doing them no matter what my illustrious co host, the Boston bad boy, I am my Pelosi, says. Yeah. Well, you know. Uh, Someday that's going to change. Yeah, I'm just you know I'm just so tired. By the time we do the show every week, I'm just so tired. I've talked to you several times throughout the week about, and I just, it's funny. I just I get here and I don't care no, anymore. That's the sound of the tiniest violin playing right now, mm. folks. You play you the that? violin. Yeah, I'm sure that's it's as good it as your uh, wrestling impersonations. <laughs> what's it like working on what's been described as some of the most innovative film projects right now? Huh? Well, we're going to find out. Because we have some of the team from Royal Goblin Films. They're going to be talking about some things here today. And I know the Boston Bad Boy is excited about that. Yeah. Who made it to the top five stories in the world of pro wrestling? You're going to find out when we reveal that during Run the Ropes. All of that plus more of your listener-submitted questions, a.k.a. Ask Duke. But before we get to any of that, Boston Bad Boy. Yeah. Golf legend. <laughs> Tiger Woods. Yeah. All right. He was in the news this yeah, week. Yeah, yeah. And it wasn't golf-related, unfortunately. No, no, no. No, no, no. Folks, unfortunately, Tiger Woods, one of the greatest golfers of all time, he was arrested for driving under the influence. Now, look, many assume that Tiger was drinking and driving, but it was revealed later on that... He was sleeping while driving. Well, he was impaired because of the medication he was taking. Oh, is that what okay. it was? Yeah. I, I, you know, to be fair, I, I didn't really follow the story much beyond the headline. It, it was just too depressing. Well, it's pretty terrible, yeah. I mean, yeah. Uh, in this country, we love, what What do we love more than people succeeding? We love when they, they fall down on Kicking the Kicking them when they're down. That's the truth. I think, I think the story of uh, Tiger getting hit with the golf club was a bigger story than him ever winning any kind of golf yeah. championship. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Would buy his wife. She she beat him up pretty bad. But you know, Tiger has well documented back issues. Mm -hmm. Which I mean, he's a golfer. He's an elite golfer. So what do you expect? You know, back. I mean, is back. it like, like repetitive? Like, is it well? What's causing that? I mean, it's not football players. Foot, golf is not a contact sport. Let me get. That's what I'm trying to say. Have you ever played golf? No. Okay. So think about the, because I think it's pointless and the, I think it's ridiculous <laughs> that grown men. No. They tap around a little yellow ball, or a little a white ball all day. You're a mess. The the motion of swinging a golf club yeah. puts a lot of no. torque on your back and what have you. It, it is, it's a common injury. All right, that's why they drink in at the golf. country club after? Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Must be so hard for them. Their little cars. Uh, would you stop their little, right uh, now? little Their little uh, manservants to carry Just the clubs for them. It must give be real, break. real, real stressful. Oh, my. You hear this guy, folks? He, he's not an athlete. That's the problem. But seriously. Golfers are athletes? Yes, they are. Get out they of here. They absolutely are. Don't start. I'll, I'll, here's my analogy. Golf is a game the way that uh, darts is a game. Okay. Are, are, are professional dart players, are they athletes? Sure. Get the hell out sure of Sure they are. Get the hell Absolutely out of Absolutely they Get are. Get out of your mind. Yep. I, and I love darts. Are, bowl, are professional bowlers athletes? Absolutely. Bowling is a game. 100%. Get out of here. 100%. Get out of here. Get out of here. So, listen. Tiger's on various medications, including Vicodin. <laughs> and let me tell you something, folks. The Duke had his wisdom teeth taken out many moons ago, <laughs> and they put me on that Vicodin stuff. Yep. I was like Grandpa Simpson. <laughs> I would be sitting there talking to you in mid-sentence and then pass out for 20 minutes mm -hmm. and then wake up and pick up the sentence. Uh, could you do that right now you know? just pass out oh, for the rest of the show? Give it me might, a be, uh, might be helpful. But the, the point is that's some pretty powerful stuff. Now, look, Tiger admitted that he made a mistake. He said that he, you know, 
he apologized. He owned up to it yeah. because he shouldn't have been driving while taking that stuff. How many spiked Arnold Palmers did he drink nope. to mix with the Vicodin? His, his, his blood alcohol level was zero. Mm. He had no alcohol really? in his system. It was really? literally. You listen, know, Tiger has a lot of money. Yeah. And I'm sure that he's a well-respected member of the community down there. Sure. And I'm sure, you know, it's possible that uh, you can look the other way on something No, like no. That. You couldn't look the other way on this. They even put out his... Uh, Field sobriety test and yeah. everything. They put it all okay. out there, you know. So it's it's all, all right. public record. Maybe that maybe whoever so he's under the over influence. He's under the influence enough to to put his name and and, and mug shot him, but not under the influence enough that it's okay to put out his sobriety. He's fine. The sobriety is fine. All that's fine. They put everything out. Mm. No, but it wasn't fine mm -hmm. because you're not supposed to be driving while you're on that stuff. For the same reason I'm talking about, it literally knocks you out, man. So here's the point, mm -hmm. and I and I bring yeah, this please. up. Like this is a pro wrestling get to the podcast, point. right? Yeah. Everybody in all walks of life have different pains, aches and pains and what have you. And, and you know, we are living I have in a, a... I have a rather large pain in my ass, and I'm looking right at him oh, right yeah. now. Wow, imagine that. <laughs> I, what, the mirror behind me? So the, the point is, though, you know, folks, please be careful out there. Well, yeah, don't be read, stupid. Yeah, read the read the directions of whatever you're on and, and make sure that you're utilizing it the way that it's supposed to be utilized, i.e., don't drive while you're under the influence of whatever prescription medication you're on. Here's something that further backs up my idea that uh, golf is not an actual sport. Oh it's a game. Goodness. Here we go. Think about guys who are in contact sports. Yep. Uh, who probably take pain medication a lot to recover from surgeries or whatever. Like pro wrestlers. Pro wrestlers. Sure. Football players, hockey players. Sure. Um, they probably understand the parameters of these drugs better than a guy who golfs, who doesn't really actually ever get injuries and all of a sudden is getting pumped up full of this stuff and is like... I'm good. I can drive home. Well, Would you say that that was the most, the costliest drive of his career? Absolutely, it was. He could have <laughs> you paid get it, somebody. Drive. Oh, it's you're, a, you're a and why does he even listen? If you had Tiger you Woods driving? money, yeah, seventy, seven hundred million. Tiger's dollars in a bad like place. That. Yeah, well, Tiger's in a bad place. He's not in a bad place. It was a mistake. He owned up. No, no, to no it. I'm talking about this is just a symptom of Tiger's bad place. Well, hey, the injuries. He's not who he used to be. Whatever. But look, my point is, and this is why I bring it up. He lost his mojo. We have a lot of pro wrestlers yep. who listen to the show, pay attention to what's going on, what have you. Agree with me. Who get injured. Yep. Who are on pain medications. Correct. And this is all legal stuff. I'm not talking about yep. anybody abusing drugs. Yep. Guys, you log a lot of hours on the, on the road. Mm -hmm. This isn't like the old days where you could just get away with that stuff. Let Tiger Woods be an example of what not to do. Please. Stay off the road. Get somebody else to drive. I'm sure there's enough fans out there, enough people that you can trust who can be the wheel man. You do not need to get behind the wheel if you're going to be up on this stuff because that's just it's well, scary. I, interestingly enough, and I don't know this occurrence enough, and you may, is there? do you think there's a, a situation where a lot of times wrestlers are wrestling while on those? While I, think it's, I think it's impossible not to. So, uh, do you think that that's? I would think that that's an incredibly dangerous situation. Sure, because but, your reaction time or whatever. Sure, but I and, think they time it out to you know. But again, it's hard to always know what the reaction is going to be. Sure, hence Tiger, who probably thought he was going to be fine. He could have taken it at dinner, and then by the time he got in the car, probably didn't eat at all, which is another thing they tell you to do: right. read the directions. Right. People people make fun of me for reading directions all the time. No, I'm a direction. When reader. I get something, the, before I even mess with it, I read the directions. I do. I know. I, I do that's too. It. I want to know the rules. You know why? Why? Because I put together a lot of Legos as a kid. Yeah. And that was it. You got your pile of See? Legos. And Look at that. all you have is your directions. Yes. You've got to go by the directions See or else that? it doesn't work. I would get the video games and I would read the book to learn oh, the I moves. Oh, I don't know if I did that. To learn the moves. See, man, well, I was never very good at games that required moves. See? I was good at uh, adventure type games. That's why, nothing... that's why I beat that ba bomb. Oh, here we go. The way that I did. But can we get okay? back one minute before we move off this subject completely? I want to talk about Tiger Woods losing his mojo. No, I don't want to talk about Why that. not? Be Look. It's golf, the most humbling sport ever. Okay. Yeah, and the guy it's, flew too close to the sun, and I his don't little know wax that. wings melted. I don't know about that. He's lost his mojo, and I'll tell you why. Why? He tried to play it too straight. Oh. He tried to play it too straight. Here's a guy, who okay, let me agree with you for a minute here, just for the sake of argument. He's an athlete. Sure. What do athletes like to do when they travel around? Whether they're married or not, they like to they like to dabble. We've had this conversation before <laughs> that if you and I were professional athletes, yeah. and we were had had money and we're traveling, we wouldn't get permanently hitched in it. You know, we, we we would keep ourselves. There would be some agreements going we, on. Well, here. we'd keep ourselves free agents, sure, so that we don't get ourselves into any kind of trouble, sure, because we know that that's just what happens. Here's Tiger, who's who has to who thinks he has to come up with this 
wholesome all-American image. You're going to get married uh, and have the kids, the 2.5 children, the dog, the home, blah, blah, blah. And he goes against his very nature and eventually comes up, catches up to him. How does it catch up to him? Golf club to the head. Uh, he's out shilling for Buick. Uh, <laughs> he ends up asleep at the wheel. I don't even know what kind of car it was. It wasn't a Buick, that's for sure. Uh, you know... He, he went against his nature. He went against the thing that brought him to the top to begin so with. So what are you trying to say? He should go out there and get married and then fool around against his wife no, and do no, all no. those things again? No, no, no. I think he needs to cut it all loose Okay. and bring back the mojo. And if this guy... Because golf... It's not coming back. How, Tiger's a young guy. He's so. an old guy. He's fairly young no, when it comes to golf. There's a lot of miles on that body, man. He, How, he's put his body through a lot. You, you do not win uh, that much. Not, uh, you do not win that much unless you're putting a lot in. Get out of here. You should have seen his exercise routine, which probably has a lot to do with his back issues, too. You're right. Your mind. Hey, like, this guy's, like this guy's guy storming uh, Iwo Jima. <laughs> <laughs> He's playing golf on a, on a, on a manicured golf is a lawn. a serious sport. Get out of here. Okay? What I'm trying to say is if he cuts all the, the, the entrapments loose... He goes out, he plays golf, gets his game back on. It's going to clear up that mental fog. He won't even, I bet he won't even need the medication. Give me a break. It's all psychosomatic. Give me a break. I'm saying it. You heard it here first. You heard it here first. <sighs> Run the ropes. It's time to run the ropes. I give my opinion on the top five stories in the world of professional wrestling. Let's go. Who keeps attacking Enzo Amore? <laughs> huh? Folks. This question is on everyone's mind right now, and, and it's something I posted on the Duke Loves Wrestling Facebook page. Enzo Amore keeps getting the living stuffing kicked out of him, and he ends up laying out backstage at Raw. Now, it's clear somebody has a real problem with him, okay? Speculation is running rampant. Some have suggested that it's the Revival, you know, the former NXT champions. Some folks have even said Nia Jax. Hmm. Maybe she doesn't like his face, so she wants to punch it. Who knows? Well, I think it's his tag team partner, Big Cass. Because Big Cass is very jealous of Enzo because he'll never be half the man Enzo is, despite the fact that he's much bigger and has longer hair than he does. doesn't matter. Head over to uh, Facebook. Head over to the Duke Loves Wrestling page there. I'm going to put up a poll. You let us know who do you think is attacking Enzo more. Well, i got to ask. Is there's no For once, there's no cameras in the backstage? I know. When Can you happens? imagine that? Well, Can you it's imagine an inside job. Yeah. Yeah, see? You know who I think's behind all this. Who? Who would, who would have the access to unplug the cameras and create controversy where there isn't any? Your buddy, Vincent Q. McMahon. Give me a break. Wrestling veterans hate Will Ospreay. <laughs> First of all, I highly doubt that, by the way. They don't give a crap about you, Will Ospreay. But uh, that's what he told USA Today, folks. Yes, the brash 23-year-old flippy mania Brit he claimed, okay, he had the audacity to claim, and listen, I'll even quote him, these veterans hate me, I don't know why. I have respect for everyone who wants to criticize my work, but please, and please do, but I'm not a shy person, I do bite back. Well, Osprey, let me tell you something, you jelly tart, <laughs> the last time you stepped out of line, I sent the man known as Vader to go out there and beat you down, pal. I'll send some more folks, okay? We'll get the real big timers after you. You keep playing games. Do not call out the veterans, you you little mealy mouth young punk, okay? I'm calling you out, Will Osprey. That's right. I gotta say, uh, it's a great it's a great premise, right? To, if you if you're nobody, to say, it's like me saying. Uh, well, Vince, I, if I started uh, putting on Vince McMahon hates me. Sure. And Donald Trump, they all hate me. But just keep, eventually. They don't even know your name. Eventually, <laughs> it may get back to them, eventually. Yeah. It doesn't hurt me. And then they beat you up. Well, See? that's never going to happen. Okay. Trump's hands are too small. Jeez. I didn't say that, by the way. Nia Jax complains. Yes, folks, Nia Jax. She took to tweet Twitter. Excuse me, to voice her support for SmackDown Live. You know, they've been using all of their female talent lately. Well, guess who hasn't? Raw. Huh? Ever since Kurt Angle came on the scene, the women have not been featured as prominently. I'm watching you, Angle. Just so you know, I'm watching you. You're as bad as Mick Foley is. Hmm. Okay? So Nia Jax throws that out there. And look, I'm not going to play games. I'm upset with Nia Jax for that match that she had with Charlotte where she messed everything up. Okay? So I hope Nia Jax has been working on her craft 
during that time. But I will say this. Monday Night Raw is a three-hour show. It is embarrassing. How it is long it is. It is completely embarrassing that you can't feature all of the women, and yet SmackDown finds a way to do so. Get your act together. I think this okay? is some ill-conceived idea that they're going to try and start a men versus women uh, thing. It would where, be great. Uh, the, who, you know, the, the men will lose. Some storyline. The men will lose. Well, we all lose because it's ridiculous. I don't just, think so. Just do it. Women can just, beat them up. Well, y yes, but I'm saying not even right. We won't even get to see that though. It's not going to be. They're not going to do uh, uh, dual gender actual matches. It's going to be all this back room crap and all this drama. <laughs> they're it, they're going to bury it and it's going to they're just going to build some sort of gender war. It's going to be really stupid because we know they're creatively bankrupt. I'm telling you, the the, the conspiracy uh, wheel is turning for this guy, folks. I don't know what's going on I'm here. Calling. I'm calling it now. You're calling gonna, it early. You're Getting gonna, it in early. You're going to love this one. Another issue with the NWA sale. <laughs> yes, folks. I, at this point, I'm sure you're as frustrated as I am. The news making the rounds this week is the current ownership of the NWA somehow, somehow managed to allow the merchandising trademarks to expire. <laughs> How do you do that? How do you do that? So think about this for a second. Oh, God. If you legally don't own the merchandising trademarks yeah. for a company, then how the hell can you sell it? We and can. more importantly, what do you own? Well, what it does is it, what it does is opens up to everyone else to sell it. Of course, uh, and undercut you. Undercut you. So, so we should jump in and buy the NWA trademark. No, you don't even need to we'll buy it. You don't need to buy it. If they don't know the trademark, they yeah. can't. They can't sue on a trademark. So all oh, you do is create the merchandise. Create the merchandise. That's it. Just create Ooh. the merchandise. You put your put their name on it. Put their wrestlers in, and you go and sell out of the trunk of your car. Yes. They can't come and say that's our trademark. All right, that's what we're gonna do. Really? Because clearly. You think I got that kind of time or interest? Listen, clearly. listen. If you want to go uh, print T-shirts, yeah. but with in, in in some back room somewhere, sure. Sell them out of the trunk of your you go out there. Well, it could be a front room since it's all legit now. <laughs> yeah. But but look, poor Billy Corgan. Oh please! Every time this guy tries to buy a wrestling company, this is what happens. Well, it sort Just of happened to his music career too, didn't it? Well, no, he's still he's he's going to be in the Hall of Fame if he's not already. Ho what but Hall of Fame? The Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Oh, get Stop out of here! But you know, Billy Corgan. Look, Diana Ross is in the Rock and Roll Hall of she's Fame. She's awesome, by the way. Uh, she should be in. She should be in a Hall of Fame, not necessarily the Rock and Roll Hall. Of I Fame. don't know about that. Billy Corgan, listen to me. All right, this is your buddy Duke talking to you here. Okay, <laughs> you may want to consider. <laughs> Buying into a different type of business because it's yeah. clear that this wrestling yeah. thing, it's just not. I don't know, them. brother. And look, I like you, Billy. I'm one of the few that actually do. I like you. <laughs> this wrestling thing ain't working out, pal. No, okay? no. You got some bad mojo going he on, might, brother. You know, he, maybe he you could know? try working at, you know, like one of those, like, like a Bisuteki or something. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. Like a yeah. hibachi restaurant. Sure. sure. Or maybe, that would uh, work. Maybe I would go to his food restaurant. Court, the food court in the mall. I would go. Something like that, I, you know. Billy Corgan's. We'll call Billy's. Why do? Why isn't you like smashing pumpkin pies? Sure. I would eat Around it. Around the holidays. I would eat it. Think about that mail order pumpkin pie. Sure. Sure. Anything but wrestling. Anything but wrestling. Yeah. And the number one story in the world of professional wrestling is... Wait, who is that according to, by the way? You always say that it's the number one story in, in the world. According to whom? Everybody. Everybody? Yes. So, you, you literally, I, I literally go to all of the wrestling sites. Uh -huh. I check all the social media, uh -huh. including our, our Duke Loves Wrestling page okay. and what have you. Whatever... The majority of the wrestling fans in the world yeah. are talking about that's the number one story okay i'm just asking what your scientific yeah. no, process that's, a good, that's is. actually a good question well yeah because you yep. just you know like, you can't just throw things around no like that. this this is definitely number oh, one all right and clearly it's number one because we're talking about extreme rules ah. that's right wwe extreme rules is live this sunday on the wwe network now look the main event is a fatal five way this is finn balor versus seth rollins versus roman reigns versus samoa joe Versus Bray Wyatt. The winner will be named the number one contender, which means they get to challenge Brock Lesnar for the Universal Championship. Ugh, why bother? I, well, Why bother? What do you mean? The Universal Championship. I know, Come on. I know. Jinder Mahal is the only real champion you know, that matters. I, I, I could create, invent my own belt right now, and yeah. it would be more impressive than the Universal Championship. I'll probably tell you not. That. Probably not. But look, forget about that match. What I want to see is the kendo stick on a pole match between Alexa Bliss and Bailey. I expect Alexa to beat some sense into Bailey and prove once and for all that five feet of fury is running wild. Okay? You hear what I'm saying to you right now? Head over to uh, Duke Loves Wrestling. Let me know who you think is going to win the kendo stick on a pole match. I don't know if they can break down the demo and, and the viewership to such a precise uh, thing, but 
it would be interesting to see if the match that contains two women wrestlers mm -hmm. outdoes a match containing five male wrestlers. Yes. There's a way to measure that. There's a way to measure. It'd be yep. interesting to see that number. I'll tell you how, how you measure that. Yeah. Social media response. That's how they do it. Whatever really? is trending that's what higher, they're... that's part of it. Yes, because. But I'm saying there's no way they can. They could. They're not telling. How, tuning in. I, it's probably too particular to, to zone it down. Well, so it's as far part as, of the, It's on the network, so it's part right. of the pay per view. Well, I bet they could see who's streaming and when or what. What's sure, on. it'd be but interesting to see whoever's interacting with the product on social right. media, which right. is a is a clear indication that they're watching. Well, it'll be interesting to see that if they have a bigger interaction, mm -hmm. whatever mm -hmm. reaction to the women's match. Featuring two wrestlers uh, than the one featuring five of their top main guys, and they still don't feature them. Going back to what you said earlier, that's a good point. Are they shooting themselves in the foot? Which well, I believe they do, and they will continue to do, as long as a man whose judgment is clouded by okay. such that's levels enough. of, that's of enough. intrigue and and deceit that's that uh, he can't you know figure out what to do with this I'm company. Sick of this guy. I'm sick of this guy, folks. Listen. Head over to YouTube. I mean, excuse me. Head over to Facebook. Head over to Twitter. Type in Duke Loves Wrestling. Let me know. Do you agree with me? Do you think I'm a jerk? Yep. Maybe something in between. Do you think the Boston Bad Boy needs to leave Vince McMahon alone? Because I sure do. No, I poor sure Vince do. McMahon. I sure poor do. Poor Vince okay? McMahon. I sure do. All right. Let us know, folks. Up next, the team from Royal Goblin Films. This is Alexa, and this is Brianna, and we're Sugar and, and, we're Spice. Sugar and Spice, and you're listening to Duke, Duke Loves Wrestling. Wrestling. Folks, back in week 56, we interviewed the members of the Valhalla Club, all right? These were three military veterans who use pro wrestling as therapy to cope with PTSD. You can head over to the Duke Loves Wrestling YouTube channel to hear that interview, and all our others as well. Now, we stated during the interview that there is actually a Valhalla Club documentary, and they had just finished up filming there. So look, here this week, we reached out to the folks over at Royal Goblin Films, Rhonda Burnett, Rebecca Garrett, and R. Bradley Morris. Say that three times fast. We wanted to get the inside scoop on the documentary and also other projects they have uh, that they're working on. So without further ado, welcome to the Duke Loves Wrestling podcast Rhonda, rebecca and brad how are you everyone hey dude hey, hey. good to be here cool 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 listen the valhalla club documentary is such an interesting concept and and you know we'll start off there with uh, Rhonda. pro wrestling used as therapy for ptsd okay so what about the project uh got you interested in it and and made you sign up to uh be involved well, Brad had uh, introduced me to the, the concept and the idea, and I, just, I wasn't able to, you know, be able there to film, but I was able to do some of the, you know, the background production of it. Um, I have many family members who uh, were in the Army and who do personally deal with PTSD, and I think the concept of, you know, trying to give them a way to cope with it is just amazing mm, mm. that's a, that's a good call out there and you know there's something a little interesting going on with you there uh, Rhonda, because you're no stranger to pro wrestling either in fact I, I hear word on the street is that you used to use uh, your siblings as uh, crash test dummies there you'd be practicing your moves <laughs> on them huh yeah I my brother he let me watch wrestling from the time that I was you know really little and there was one time I was about three years old and I uh, tackled him from the bed, and he fell into a window. And he can attest for this because he still has the scar on his back oh, from no. the window breaking. Oh, no. <laughs> so you basically speared him through the window. Look at that. I did. Yeah. See? All right. So so we know that uh, Ronda's the one that we're going to use if we want to have any pro wrestlers beaten up there, uh, Boston Bad Boy. <laughs> Write her name down on my list of pro wrestler, pro wrestling tough guys. Nobody there. wants to work for you. Hey, listen. I don't, I don't listen, even want to be here I'm right building now. Duke's Dynasty, okay? No, We're going to have some folks who can get the job done. Rhonda will do the spear through the window, okay? That's a big one. Can you? These people have, their time is precious. Can you just get on with it? <laughs> They're talented people, unlike yeah, you. Well, can hey, you just get on with know, the interview? Not, well, when I, I get excited when I talk to the muscle. When I talk to the muscle, <laughs> oh, I get excited, okay? Now, Rebecca, 
you're another one there where it's actually you're the complete opposite. You don't even know anything about pro wrestling before you started on this project, and yet you were co-director. So tell me, how did you get involved in that? Um, I actually had met Jan um, through a modeling gig, and then I met Brad, and Brad and Jan collaborated, and Brad was like, really excited about it and so I was like okay well if you think this is something I should do I'll do it so I went to my first show and I it was fun I met Mr. B and he was super nice to me before the show and then he comes out in his wrestling persona and just like blows me away I was googling and ever since then I just kind of enjoyed going to the indie film or, I'm sorry, indie wrestling shows. Ooh, listen, so hold on a second. You, you're a model, too, huh? So here you are, this this model, and Boston Bad Boy. Yeah. Stop fixing your hair, by the way. She can't see. <laughs> my me. hair is... <laughs> stop, first of all. No, 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 First of all, my hair is always perfect. Yeah. No, okay? But you don't need to do that. I'm talking to the young lady here. So you were a model. You, you didn't know much about the wrestling world before. Now you're going to co-direct this project. And you, you get to go backstage, and you see all these muscled up, sweaty wrestlers here. Did that make you a fan? Tell the truth. Here. <laughs> I would have to say no because um, I actually I don't have a background in wrestling, but um, I do have a background in powerlifting, weightlifting. Oh. So being around muscling men really been around it before. It's not what made me a fan of wrestling. So you hear that, guys? All you fellows in the wrestling business, just because you got big muscles, that doesn't mean that uh, she's going to give you the time of day. So well, you got to follow up mind. with what did what did make her a fan, or if is did she become a fan throughout the creation of this documentary? Oh, that's a good question. Look at that. Are you, do you want to take over the interview now? Look at this. Huh? I'm already doing a better job. Can you let the lady answer the question? <laughs> Go ahead, Bex. Did, did you become a fan for another reason? Um, yeah, I actually fell in love with how the wrestlers interact with the crowd and how they can get them going and how they can just change the over, overall mood of the event. Ah, uh, they turned the light on. So See I that? Guess, I guess I fell in love with their acting. So. That's a, that's a good answer. Okay, you see that, Boston Bad Boy? Right. You asked a good question, you got a good answer for it there. See? <laughs> now, Brad... <laughs> Oh, my part of this interview, I wasn't. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, look, I, I, I had to say, I'm not going to say I saved the best for last, but you are a guy who has the audacity to tell people on the street that you're shy. But you got a, a big personality, brother. And I appreciate that, man. It, it's funny, though, because you're, you're 100% Texas, and mm -hmm. you grew up being a fan of. Uh, Eddie Guerrero and uh, the Heartbreak Kid Shawn Michaels. So oh man! Tell us about that. Tell us about being a fan of those two wrestlers. Well, as a child, I grew up loving Shawn Michaels. Uh, I always had severe confidence issues growing up, and uh, I guess I always I wanted to grow up and become Shawn Michaels. As a little boy, I loved Elvis Presley, the Showmanship. Uh, I always loved that, and then I got into pro wrestling because of my father, uh, who was also a veteran. Um, he, and I just thought Shawn Michaels was everything I wanted to be as a man. You know, he was charismatic. He was funny. He was, uh, always in your face. He was, and he was the guy, you know, he was the short guy because I'm not that tall, especially for a Texan. Uh, <laughs> so he was like the little short guy that overcame everything. Um, and then later on there was, uh, Eddie Guerrero, um, who I, he would became the, uh, first, uh, Latino WWE world champion. And, uh, that was, uh, sorry, I, I, I like I still get emotional about Igor because he passed away. Um, as we all know, um, he was he was a hero to me. He was an icon in the business, and he had such a hardship growing up. And mm. uh, uh, if you read my IMD profile, um, I've had my own share of tragedies as well. And that doesn't even cover very little of the stuff that I endured. And showing his accomplishments and what he was able to overcome spoke so much to me growing up. And it, he became a role model to me of, uh, you know, if he can overcome and be successful and be what he was. And I saw the backstage footage of when he won the belt. He called his wife, and he was saying, I love you, and this is for you. And, and he was so appreciative and so grateful and always so humble. And um, when I was working on the Hollywood Club, I spoke to Jan actually about it, and he said that he had met him. He said he was just a wonderful guy. And 
I was a little envious over it, but you know, just to hear that story was a lot for me. Yeah, that that sure is, and and it's funny because when we fast forward to uh, you working on you were, you co-directed the Valhalla Club documentary there, and yeah. you actually your your father was in the military before, is that correct? Uh, yes, sir. He was a uh, veteran. Uh, he had passed away in 2007 uh, due to Agent Orange poisoning that he received in Vietnam. Wow. He had a disorder and. It was a hardship on the family and on myself. And uh, when Jan had approached me with the project, um, a good way to get my attention, just to let everyone know, all the listeners, if you want to get my attention, take me to dinner. Um, I will definitely <laughs> listen to your concept. Uh, Jan did that, bought me a beer. We talked about the project, and I was all in, uh, 100%. Uh, it was something that I was really passionate about. And meeting the rest of the boys, they were so great to work with. All of them were. Um, and I wanted to include... The, I think the hardest part that we have with the project was editing it because we have so much great footage that the world may never see. Mm. You know? And it's so sad because they were all so talented, even uh, Heart of Texas Wrestling and uh, NAWA Wrestling and all the promotions we worked with. All those guys were so welcoming and so talented. And I wish we could have just included all of them. We put all we could in there. <laughs> I hear that. Now, you guys did some uh, private screenings. And I know that the response has been tremendous. I'm hearing on the on you know on the wire, so to speak, because you know I like to keep my ear to the ground, get a little bit of the gossip. There's some interest in putting the documentary through the festival circuit. There, what, what's going on with that? Oh, okay, yeah. Well, apparently you know a lot, so that's awesome. <laughs> uh, <laughs> don't yes, don't get his head too big. Stay out of this. The man compliments the Duke. Stay out of this. Uh, I think you give him a hard enough time, Boston bad boy. That's I think right. He, uh, you know, he, he needs a little bit of a praise occasionally. That's right. All right. I'll, I'll allow it. That's right. <laughs> what we're going to do is we are planning on uh, – we're already – actually, we had a call from a distributor uh, today as well. We are in talks with the distribution company. Wow. Um, we do want to work the festival circuit. Uh, myself, Rhonda, and Rebecca, and Jan have all discussed on what we want to do with the project. And we feel as though that we work the festival circuit for, you know, a couple, a few months, see how we test. Uh, it'll perhaps get even more interest with distributors. And um, we're hoping that in the long run, mainly just a, a, just a great amount of people see this so we can bring more awareness to post-traumatic stress disorder and what's going on. Uh, mental health is a really big passion of all of ours involved in the project. And it's just something that's really important to us. So, yes, um, the festival circuit is definitely something we're uh, looking leaning towards right now. Well, that's cool. And, you know, folks on the Duke Loves Wrestling uh, Facebook and Twitter page, we'll put up the information for uh, Royal Goblin Films and what have you, and even the Valhalla Club documentary, so you can let your local festival circuit folks know that you'd like to see this documentary locally there. So I have a question from a production standpoint for the documentary. This can go out to anybody who wants to who wants to answer it. Did you find that the when you're interviewing the folks to make the documentary, the wrestlers, a lot of them are they're not pro they're pro wrestlers, but they're not on TV guys all the time. Were they comfortable in front of the camera, and were they were they comfortable opening up about this on camera? Let's go to that, Rebecca. That's on a that very thing. that's a that's a very permanent thing to do. It's not it's not sort of a casual conversation. It's sitting there and sort of being looked at really intently. And was that strange, or did you think did they jump into it easily? Let's go to Rebecca on that one. There. Oh, well, I was there. Many of the shoots. I think I might have missed maybe one. All of the wrestlers. Yon, Eddie, and Bryson did a tremendous job just being on camera. They weren't afraid to, you know, really talk about what was, what was on their mind. They were real natural. Uh, we didn't have to lead them in too many directions. They knew how it should flow. It made filming so easy. Well, that's great, just because we've talked, and we've talked to those guys as well several times, uh, about just getting over the stigma of what, you know, the mental health stuff. And to be the first folks that are really starting to do it is sort of the hardest. You're yeah. the first through the glass, you know, and you get, it's the, you're, it's the most awkward when you're the first to do it. And so it's, it's, it's good to know that it was, you know, um, a natural thing. It felt natural for them to do it for them to be comfortable enough to talk about it, which then hopefully this documentary opens it up to a lot more people. Yeah, that's true. 
That's true. Hey, Rebecca, this is uh, one of your first projects that you actually directed there. What, what was the most challenging part about being a, a director? It, oh, um, I think the most challenging, challenging part would have to be keeping up with the scheduling because I'm, I'm a busy person. I was in college full-time, part-time job, and then I did this pretty much full-time. So mm-hmm. it was kind of hard balancing everything out and being able to give 100% towards the project, but I was able to put in 110%, and I think it turned out great, but I would have to say balancing everything, mm. that was the hardest part. That's a, that's a good call out there, and, and you know, Rhonda, you've been in the business for a, a few years now, and, and you do a lot of the production stuff, um, which is just, that's, you can have the art out front. And that's important, but if you don't have someone who understands how to edit it properly and package it in a manner that is going to be uh, palatable, then it's not going to work, no matter how good the the front end was there. Uh, Is the gap between women who work in production, film production, is that gap between women and men, is it starting to close or do you find that we're still a long way off here? Well, I certainly believe that the gap is starting to close. The people, the men that I've worked with um, who work on the production end have, you know, been very, very kind to me and very willing to help teach me, maybe show me stuff that I don't know yet because I am still learning the production end. I'm actually an actress um, who has recently, you know, gotten an interest in wanting to, you know, know the production side. Um and the men that I have worked with have been very, very kind, and I haven't had a problem personally wow, that's, with that gap. That's a big deal because uh, you can feel the gap. And I mean, yeah. you know, it's, it's really unfortunate and ridiculous that even in 2017, we, we still have to talk about these things. Uh, mm-hmm. But it's cool to, to know that at least people who you're partnering with are, are being respectful and, and, and helping you out there. And what what's interesting, we always talk about the gap in wrestling itself mm. between men and women. And only recently, mm-hmm. you know, production, film production, music production goes back even further than the history of professional wrestling in many ways. And it's only now they're still on the same pace of when they're going to fully integrate men and Silly. women in, in a lot of these creative positions. So Silly. it's an interesting uh, reflection there. Yeah, it's it's silly there. And, you know, Brad, you were a guy who had started out in your career doing film uh, yeah. directing and, and production, the whole yes, nine sir. yards there. And then you actually took some time away. Oh, yes, sir. So you, you, you had a little one, and you, and you took some time away. How has parenting, how has becoming a parent changed the way that you approach the the film industry? Um, I'm going to answer that question with, uh, another, with a piece of advice for filmmakers that are trying to get into the business. And... Uh, a question that I'm often asked is, uh, so how do you how do you do it all? Uh, the truth is, with film, the reason why I left filmmaking was in 2005. I had a little girl, and she became my entire world. Uh, the lifestyle film is very, and I think Rhonda and Becca, as Becca said, it's very schedule paced, and Rhonda can attest, it's uh, very hectic and very busy. Uh, your schedule stays full, and with that comes sacrifice. Uh, since I got back into film uh, last year, I will be honest, and this is uh, heart-wrenching to say, I don't see my daughter as much as I used to before I got back into film. Wow. Um, yeah, and, and it is heartbreaking. I have full custody of her, and she, you know, and sometimes daddy's a rumor, you know? <laughs> and uh, she, she understands what I do. She loves what I do. Um, she has a passion for um, acting and a passion for filmmaking, so naturally I encourage her to be a veterinarian. So, <laughs> um, because it's not a lifestyle for everyone, which is why I work with the people that I work with. I tend to uh, pat myself around younger filmmakers that are trying to get into it, like Rhonda and Rebecca and Michael Benia, uh, who work on this project as well, mm. and uh, to see whether they really want to do this. Because I learned very young, um, when I, well, I was a teenager when I started, uh, people say they want this. People love watching movies. Of course you love watching movies. Movies are fantastic. They're entertaining. Making a movie is a whole other story. You know, the Holocaust, a 45-minute short, it took six months to shoot. It took three months to edit. 
it's not easy. You know, there's a lot of treasure, and then there's reshoots, and there's scheduling conflicts, and then you don't have a personal life. That's over with. Wow. Like, you, you really don't. Um, that comes with this. And um, being a parent, I've left film for a decade. Um, she got old enough, and I was actually going pre-law. I went back to college, and I got talked into writing a film. And then next thing you know, I was producing it. Next thing you know, I was running a company, and now here I am. Every time, yeah. you, every oh. time you got out, they pulled Pull you back, you back in? in. <laughs> Every time. It's, 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 a, it's, a vicious, it's a vicious web that you can't escape. And that's the thing. Uh, I think they all can attest, Rebecca and Rhonda alike can attest, that once you have the film bug, you either have it or you don't. You love this business or you don't. Uh, same thing with wrestling. Um, you either, uh, because uh, I think Bryson, I want to I wanna uh, brag about him for a moment. Uh, there's one, uh, I'm not saying that all three of them don't do this, but Bryson can attest that I, I've seen him market himself. Yes. And when you're running your own film studio, when you're running your own uh, brand, when you're running your own name, you're all, you're, it's a 24-7 job. There are no holidays. There are no weekends off. You're constantly branding. You're constantly promoting yourself. You don't talk about the no's that you receive, and you get a lot, a lot more of those than yeses. You, you have to, you know, connect with your people. You, and and, and there, it's, a, it's a nonstop battle, you know, and some days are better than others. And there are days where I'm, like, exhausted, completely wore out. And I still get up every day, and I push just as hard as I did the day before. You know, it's it's interesting you say that. Um, so I, I work in radio in my alter ego job when I'm not dealing with Duke, which is <laughs> thankfully most of the time. And uh, our boss, we do these series of web shorts with some of the hosts on the on this on the stage, and they're fun. You know, two minutes, whatever. That's pretty straightforward stuff to do: writing, editing, blah blah blah, putting it together. So uh, one of the higher ups came up with an idea: let's do let's do a movie version of you know uh, these web shorts. And I said, movie version? Okay. Well, what do you mean? They're like, no, like feature length movie i'm like 90 oh, 90 minutes yeah yeah you could just and, and do it sort of in you know just do it in your spare time it took oh almost a year to shoot <laughs> it took almost a year to shoot and you know write 90 pages or 100 pages or whatever it was and put it all together and it was fun and exhausting and insane but like you said a lot of people don't know what really goes into that um, and when we saw the finished product and it actually looked halfway decent, <laughs> you know, it's stuff you filmed the previous year, uh, you know, it was, uh, it was great, but you have to be, you have to have that commitment to it because sometimes a project takes that long. Mm. Mm -hmm. That's deep. Yeah. That's deep. So we yeah. got, we got yeah. a bunch of film nerds on here today. Well, folks. I, and I wanted to say, what do you, what would you say with all the technology we have out right now? You know, you, you uh, every Apple computer or whatever, you've, you've got Final Cut or you've got at least Movie Maker or something. You've got every, every phone has a camera. If, if you're a kid or, or a young person trying to get into it, wh what are the things you think they should practice on to get proficient at it to then maybe move into the, to the actual business? Okay, uh, I'm going to answer a professional question, then I'll let Rebecca handle the more technical aspect of the, of the camera work uh, and give advice on that. From a professional end, I work as a producer. And if you want to get into film production as a producer on the business end of it, getting production done, uh, the first advice I give to anyone is um, be professional. Watch how you uh, use your Twitter. Watch how you use your Facebook. People are looking. I, saw, I communicate with people in L.A. every single day. I communicate with people in Florida, uh, New York, um, constantly. And I'm talking about people who run major motion picture studios like Warner Brothers and so forth. I deal with these people on a daily basis, and that happens because of my attitude and how I conduct myself professionally. Uh, from the technical end, I'll let Rebecca ha uh, answer that one because I rely on her for a lot of that. Um, as far as the technical end goes, I definitely, whatever camera you're using, I would definitely recommend learning all of your settings and all of the lenses that you have available to you because that helps me a lot. Um, mm -hmm. Michael is actually the one who taught me most of that stuff. And at first it was kind of all like mind boggling, but as I worked with the equipment and kind of practiced on some things um, in my spare time, I came to love everything about the camera, which led into my photography getting even bigger. It not only helped me in the film industry, but I learned a lot more in photography as well.
So it's sort of like practice, 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 shoot, 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 and and just get comfortable working in the medium. I mean, that, that sort of makes yeah. sense to me. And, and it kind of leads me to another question. Why film? You know, you guys thought this was a great idea. What made you realize it would be a great idea for film for this documentary versus something else? Uh, when it comes to good ideas, I don't think I ever had a single one in my entire life to watch the film. Uh, um, because um, certain mediums, and and I, I'm a big fan of podcasts. I'm I like I I really am. I'm a big fan of web series. Uh, when it comes to film, when you're limiting yourself to the amount of storytelling, people talk about books as a medium, and people always complain when Harry Potter gets turned into a movie, or uh, you know this big piece of literature, The Great Gatsby gets turned into a, uh, a movie, and like F. Scott Fitzgerald, no justice at all. And I'm like, no, it didn't. But they captured something absolutely beautiful in a very short amount of time and this day and age let's be honest with you i mean let's be honest with everyone uh people don't have the attention span that they used to have mm -hmm. uh we're, we're losing more and more of our attention span and when you do a beautiful mixture of the art of cinema and audio and you're putting it all together and you're creating this beautiful story and you're taking, you know, as I stated before, we have so much footage of these three men and their in-ring action and their testimonies. And they spoke for almost an hour, and we have to narrow these segments down to five minutes but still be able to capture an audience. That's the art, and that's the talent behind it all. And I think the best way to get it out to an audience is through a film. Um, you know, people don't read anymore, mm. and they, they really do you know, they really don't. They say they do, but they don't. <laughs> um, people feel as I, we all feel as though that film is the quickest, most effective way to reach a vast audience. Yeah, that's a, that's a good call. That's a good call. We're talking to the team over at uh, Royal Goblin Films about uh, the Valhalla Club documentary and some other projects they have going on. Speaking of which, Rhonda, I need you to help me. Okay. How long have you been waiting on hey, that? Listen, man, I've been I've been saving that one. <laughs> Rhonda, I don't and, and since you're the muscle, don't be intimidated by, you know, the 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 model uh director over there or you know the, the big shot in Brad over here, Mr. Everyman. I need you to help me out. You're on the Duke Loves Wrestling podcast and, and we're listened to all over the world. Our audience has grown accustomed to receiving scoops. OK, we're talking breaking news and yeah. you folks over at Royal Goblin, I know you have some special projects going on. I tried to do a little digging outside and everyone kept saying, yeah, they got some secret project, but we can't say what it is. And it's like, no, 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 no. Somebody's going to have to tell the Duke what's going on. OK, <laughs> so Rhonda, I'm, I'm going to lean on you a little bit. Give us an exclusive. What? project do you have going on right now that's a big secret that you can release to the world right now in this moment well you know we do have a little some things here and there that we're working on um, no 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 hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> we didn't invite you on to the duke loves wrestling podcast okay we got we got listeners in in china we have listeners in england we have listeners in Brazil. The Russians we, are listening. The Russians are listening. We didn't bring you on this show to talk about something. We want to know what the thing is. Come on. We're, we're counting on you here. You're the muscle. Help me, Rhonda. What is the special project? Okay. We're doing a project in June, actually. Uh, starting about next weekend, not this coming one, but the one after that. Uh-oh. Uh, called Sophie and Me. Yes. Um, it's a short film on it deals with mental health. Yes, um, it's about it's about um, a young female who is trying to deal and cope with schizophrenia, and it shows how she uses you know the people around her to help her get through those moments in her life. Wow, that mentally she's not stable to deal with. Wow. Now, is this a documentary or a straight film? It's a short film. Wow. Wow. You see that? 
Well, I find it interesting. I mean, did you guys get into sort of this idea of working and, and, and talking about these subjects? I mean, was that something that you were sort of working on before you got into the Valhalla Club stuff? Or is it sort of come to the surface as you work through it? Well, I know me, me and Brad personally, we've always really been into advocating, you know, helping out, mm -hmm. bringing awareness to the different mental health and, you know, the mental health community. And um, I've dealt with, you know, depression and severe anxiety. And I believe it's super important to, you know, bring those people's stories to life because they are real and they're not something that you can just, you know, push under the rug and they don't exist. You need to talk about them. Absolutely. Yeah. Ignoring them is not going to make them go away. That's a, that's a great call out. And Brad, do you have anything to add to that? Well, we um, we have the Central Texas College Film Festival that we are hosting. That uh, Rebecca is running primacy lead on that whole thing because she's straight boss. And we also have another project that is in the line. Um, we have started conducting a series for network. Uh, we're going to be approaching major networks and film studios in regards to this project, where we're going to be able to highlight the works of uh, filmmakers like ourselves, uh, not us, but other filmmakers. Um, like what we do is called micro-budget filmmaking. Uh, we shoot on a very low budget, and we make magic happen. We try to present, you know, quality. And there's a lot of these filmmakers around the country, people who are just not getting their opportunity to shine. So... Um, we at Royal, at Royal Goblin Films constructed this idea not too long ago about how can we get more of these filmmakers out there? How can we get these people to a national audience? How can they get their, you know, 15 minutes of fame? How can they get their opportunity? So I'm sitting around, going around some ideas that we had brewing. Um, I called Rebecca up at, I guess, 1 in the morning and pitched it to her. She goes, oh, let's do it called Rhonda. She goes, and uh, it was a concept that her and I were playing around with, and I kind of tweaked it a little bit, and she goes, oh my, wow, that's just brilliant. Let's let's do it. And um, so we're going to be starting work on that as soon as we finish Sophie and Me, like within the next week. We're going to start working on this project and start reaching out to other filmmakers. So any filmmaker out there listening, be sure you go to uh, Facebook and like our page at uh, Royal Goblin Films. And uh, we'll be reaching out to all of you very, very soon. Wow. Look at See, you come to the Duke Loves Wrestling podcast and you get the exclusives. That's How right. do you like that? Huh? <laughs> I'm telling you. I may, have to sub I, may I may have to submit my name so I can get the hell out of doing this podcast well, you, and get into filmmaking. No, you, you, it, and no matter what you do, life. you're still going to do this show. Okay, oh, yeah. <laughs> Best producer going today. Listen, uh, Rebecca. If, if any of our listeners want to reach out to uh, you know a young filmmaker like yourself, if they want to collaborate on projects or get some advice, uh, do you have any website or, or social media that you'd like to plug? Here's your opportunity to put your stuff out there. Um, I do. I have a personal page, but um, I like to communicate with my business page, which is um, RLG Photography. That's r.l.g and then photography if you just set up on facebook you should find me fairly easy i'm located in waco texas cool cool how about yourself Rhonda? how can folks uh, reach out to you do you have any uh websites or social media you want to plug um i'll go ahead uh, my imbd page you can look me up on imbd it'll just be Rhonda r-h-o-n-d-a burnett b-u-r-n-e-t-t-e and you can also um, look up more about me and follow my information on our Royal Goblin Film Facebook page. Sweet, sweet. And how about you, Brad? How can folks uh, get in touch with you, especially if they want to get some business going? Best way to contact me is contact Rebecca. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, you have no idea how serious I am about that, too. No, actually, best way to reach out to me is uh, through my Facebook. I'm always on it. I'm always promoting uh, my people and what's going on with us. Uh, and that is at R. Bradley Morris. Um, and I, so that's the best way to reach out to me. Good stuff. Good stuff. Listen, I, I want to... I want to read something off uh, to you folks. It, it was a uh, message that I received recently uh, from one of our loyal listeners. And it's, it's interesting because they had heard the 
about the uh, Valhalla Club, and they listened to the interview that we did with the guys, uh, Jan, Eddie, and, and Bryson, and this was their response. Hi, Duke. Great interview with the Valhalla Club. So pumped to see wrestling used as a positive coping skill. Wrestling has helped me in my recovery from bipolar disorder and OCD. The suicide stat is scary here in New Jersey. The opioid problem has been a, become an epidemic as well. So I'm so happy to hear that these guys are battling stigma and challenging the lawmakers. True heroes. Great work by you, the show, and the uh, folks who did the documentary. Brave men and women. So, you know, that's the type of feedback that we've been receiving, um, putting this information out there. So, I, and I want to commend you, the the filmmakers and the producers, for doing it. I mean, this is literally, I can't think of another time where I've seen anything on this level as it pertains to pro wrestling. And the fact that we're talking about military veterans battling PTSD, using wrestling as therapy, that just opens up all different types of possibilities. Um, and for you folks to take that story and put it out there, share it with the world, uh, you know, I, I commend you for it. So thank you. Thank you. And thank you uh, to the writer who wrote that. And I appreciate you guys a lot for promoting what we do and our art. We are storytellers, and our stories are never heard without you people, you know, sharing what we do. And we thank you all for doing that. So I, I got one last question here as we wrap up, and I, I need to know this because I do I do like movies. Uh, what's all y'all's favorite movie? Uh, and you can go one at a time, and then then we'll then we'll ask Duke because I don't actually know the answer to what his favorite movie is, and I'm sure we'll make fun of it. Oh god. <laughs> okay, uh, Rhonda, you want to go ahead and get started? Oh goodness. Okay. <laughs> My favorite film is Labyrinth. Ah. Director Jim Hansen, yep. you know, with David Bowie in it. Correct. That is my all-time staple favorite. David Bowie in tight pants. Exactly. <laughs> Unbelievable. <laughs> Unbelievable. <laughs> All right, uh, uh, Rebecca. Rebecca. Yeah. Um, so I think the thing for animated movies, I love um, Pixar, Disney. Um, so my favorite film right now is Moana. I'm absolutely absolutely in love with that show right now that's good recent one and again pixar and they do amazing stuff of course. uh the incredibles is one of my favorite films but not the favorite all right yeah. brad big bad brad what do you got oh wow do we have another hour to talk <laughs> uh, um i would have to say uh geez um clerk would probably be the movie that changed my life. <laughs> oh, boy. First there you go. Kevin Smith. Yep. Uh, Clerks 2 was even better. Um, but I love Clerks. I, I think it's a great thing for any, any filmmaker. So you, you, think, you think the sequel was better than the original? I do. And you know, I, I thought the story was just powerful. And it really... It, I was coming around the same age that they were at right. that point in time. And it spoke to me as a person. And... It just—it really hit me hard. If we—if we had another—if we had another hour, we could sit and talk about. There are very few instances where sequels have been better than the originals. Unfortunately, we don't have the time. But I will say, a movie whose sequel and sequels were awful, but remains my favorite movie on very, very many different levels, is Jaws. I will contend to the end of the day that I, that is the perfect movie. Can you tell he's from the Boston area, folks? Listen to that. <laughs> Listen to that. I can tell. I can tell. The you original know. Jaws is the perfect movie. It is perfectly paid. Everything about it is right from a filmmaking standpoint. Well, Duke, hey, what do you got? Incredible. I'm, I'm very simple and predictable. The Godfather. Oh, come I on. love the whole trilogy, but there's something about You're the original. You're saying Godfather 1. Something about the All original right. that tugs at my heart. Even when it's on TV late at night and I'm flipping channels, I'll stop and watch it. I'll stay up and watch it. Just right. absolutely ma magnificent we'll have in to have, every way. We'll have to have the gang back on uh, yes. for again, and we'll just talk just movies sure. and talk about how h horrible your ideas are oh for movies. Oh, my goodness. Because I, everyone I knows, apologize for this Everyone guy, knows folks. Godfather yeah. 2 is yeah. a superior film. Give but me a we'll break. We'll move on. Give me a break. And, and, and once again, Becca, if you could see this guy, when I said you were a model, he's fixing his hair. Oh, and, and come on. Give me a break. Come okay? on. Okay? She can't see you, by the come way. Come on. Thank God she can't see you. Yeah. The Royal Goblin Films crew. Thanks for joining us, folks. Thank you for having us, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you for having us. It was great. You know, it's interesting because we, we had such great guests there from Royal Goblin Films. Mm -hmm. Great folks there. Yep. Um, 
and you just you had to put yourself over. Listen, I, I didn't you put know? myself over as much as I steamrolled you because it, just, it had to. Because this is a thing of yours. Godfather by the way. one. Now listen, I it's understand Godfather. It's a great movie, but if we're talking about Godfather, two is a it's universally renowned as I a, love as a great film. I'm, don't make me say anything negative about two because I would never do that. But Here's one my point. I can one. factually back up my argument that Jaws is perhaps the greatest motion picture of all time. I, I don't think you can do that with Godfather 1. Are you Godfather 2, you can make a technical argument. Are you kidding argument. me right now? Godfather 1, you can't I'm do it. I'm going to make him one offer you can't refuse. Yeah, okay. Come on. It's, uh, Come it's, on. That's, one of the mo- that's one of the most famous lines in all of cinema. Are you kidding me right now? Huh? And you're going to tell me that that's not the greatest? You know it's another great... All righty then, from Ace Ventura. <laughs> are we going to say that that's a great movie because it has a quotable line? Sure. Is that what we're going to do? Sure. Okay. <laughs> nonsense. Absolute <laughs> nonsense. You're embarrassing it. me. All right. Enough of you. Up next, folks, we have more of your listener-submitted questions, a.k.a. Ask Duke. But before we get to any of that, you know what time it is. It's time for Barnyard Cheese. That's right, Barnyard Cheese over in New York City. Listen, it's hot out there, okay? It's June 1st, so you know that we finally have uh, gone over the other side of the hill, getting some sun. Some of you folks are going to get some color on that skin there. You know, something going on. <laughs> so you may not want that big, heavy, steaming sandwich, like a Duke sandwich, which if you do, it's the best sandwich yeah, around. Don't bother. Get yourself a salad, okay? Huh. Because Barnyard Cheese has some of the tastiest salads around. And you know something? You got to try a ginger roux. The Boston bad boy has been, his mouth has been watering for a delicious, refreshing ginger roux. We're talking ginger beer mixed with iced tea. Now, I'm wondering if we could do a ginger roux and then make it a variation on the classic dark and stormy by adding a little rum on top. Hey, hey, for hey, a little, hey. For a little summertime refreshment. As long as you're not driving, Tiger Woods. Okay? <laughs> you told me he was clean. I Listen, I, right. I'm going to I'll have the same BAC as him. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> uh, but I'm just saying, and, uh, when you're on the yacht and you want to have a refreshing summer drink, you might that might be a good thing. Man, the best. The best. Just put a little lemon in there and you're all set. You're ready to go. Stop depriving yourself of deliciousness. Head over to barnyardcheese.com for more info. Enjoy. See, you do it to a concert. I just don't care. But one thing I do care about is Duke's wrestling. And I got what the guy has nothing but love for the business. You know, speaking of Steve Cox, yes, I haven't heard from him on the uh, social media lately. You know, he's, he's usually been... usually he's very uh, yeah. He jumps in. He's well, in the fray. You know, Steve has been spending a lot of time with the family. Okay, I think they've uh, done to him what Trump's people try to do. They <laughs> take say, the hey, phone away. take take the phone away. <laughs> you know, stay off the social media. Oh, come you know? on! But no, we love Steve. Steve's a good friend of the show, and uh, and he's just and a good he has, guy. And he has fans that he's garnered just from commenting. Yes, he has. You know, just, from, just from jumping into our various conversations online and and other things. It's amazing. He's built a whole new fan base. He may be more over. For some of the crazy <laughs> stuff he says on social media than ever from wrestling. Right, you, gotta you, know? to, you gotta hand it to a guy like that who can I'll, reinvent himself. I'll tell you a funny story about Steve Cox, though. And, and I'll, I'll make this quick. When he went over to Japan, mm-hmm. UWFI, um, it was what they called worked shoots. Meaning that they would put him in situations where he was having like MMA style matches, but they were predetermined. Okay. They had to talk Steve into losing on purpose. Because, because he would just fight. He would beat the hell out of these guys. Even though he, like like any other time, it was it was all, yeah, so we're, we're, you know, it was supposed to be a give and take. And I don't think there was really anyone that he fought over in Japan. And yeah. some of those matches are awesome, by the way. Right. I don't think there was anyone he fought over there that he couldn't beat the hell out of if he wanted to. <laughs> Steve is a bad dude, man. <laughs> Steve is a bad dude. He just didn't want to, he didn't want to listen to it. No, well, I mean, he, he made enough money um, doing what he had to do. He'd take the money. But I'll tell you what, if any of those fights were legitimate, my money's on Steve Cox. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Because, you know, because in his mind, yes. he's already won. At, well, that's it. And you can't defeat an opponent you like that. You can't defeat an opponent. He has nothing to lose. <laughs> I'm telling you. What do you have uh, for us, you know, I, I feel like boy. every time we get into this segment of the show, I've got a lot to lose. Like, my patience, my oh mind. Oh, my God. Here we go. Dealing just with to, these listeners. Just don't fix your hair again like you did when you I know, told you. I told there. you. Like the werewolf of London, my hair is perfect. Oh, Remember that song? Good stuff. Uh, all right, let's go through here. What do we got? So our first question is from 
Brother Jabari. Oh, Brother Jabari. You know, he just had a birthday. Really? The other day. Yeah. What'd you get him? Yeah. Same thing I got him last year. So nice. And the year before that? Yeah. You're a real gentleman. You know that? <laughs> you're, real, you're a real good friend. He's a good guy. All right. So the question is, Duke, what are your thoughts on Sasha Banks being on 205 Live? Oh, boy. Well, look. look. I look. didn't realize that. That's what's happening? Well, time out. Time out. I know a lot of people have been complaining about this, right? Well, strikes me as a bit odd. Well, take it easy here. I'm just going to say this. I know 205 Live has, has had some challenges on the WWE Network. They're not pulling in as much uh, viewership as some of the other shows. And taking a big name like Sasha Banks and having her appear this past week, hopefully that you know brings more of an audience there. So I'm not against it because I understand the concept of taking somebody established putting them on something that is not doing so well, they'll bring it up to a level. And I just hope this doesn't continue to be a recurring thing because mm -hmm. that, you know, Sasha needs to be well, on Raw and do what she does on it's Raw. It's interesting that you that you don't have a problem with it because yeah. she is one of your favorites. Well, she is. So and that, well, that, I just uh, don't want to make a big deal well, out of Well, you know, it's funny when you say stuff like that, it makes me think. It may, but we'll get back to it, I think. Nah, we'll get, right. we're gonna get back to that later. Whatever. Right? Because uh, whatever. that seems a little interesting. Keep so going. let's go to another question here. Oh, here we go. This one's from a real visionary. A real a real good egg, as I'd like to say. Mm. A man named R.J. Krasinski. Oh, my God. Not another R.J. nonsense. Listen, yeah. he is you know. a gentleman and a scholar, and he understands the ins and outs of uh, discourse and he having, has a, been uh, having, harassing a, having a great conversation and no. really knows he's a man's man. No, he's been harassing. He's a man's man. He's like your henchman, okay? Henchman. He's been harassing poor Dingo. Please. On Twitter, Please. Dingo, who doesn't he's, he doesn't bother anybody, by the way. Dingo, Dingo is one of the nicest people oh, in, in all of the internet. By the I'm way, I'm not even gonna I'm not even okay? gonna justify doesn't bother anybody that with the response. And this, and this Dingo. R.J. Krasinski, Dingo. Okay, he's like a, a, a hired hitman yeah. here. Well, he keeps calling out Dingo for some reason. Well, because Dingo fighting your battles. Listen, it's gonna the thing is he's got to keep calling out Dingo because Dingo's way in his mother's basement and he can't <laughs> hear all the time. Give and he's gonna get break. called out. Give me a to break. get a life. Well, when was the last time you think Dingo saw the sun? Give him a stop it. When was the last time? You stop it. You think Dingo's ever kissed a woman? You, would you cut it out? I'm just asking. He has a kid. That doesn't mean anything. Oh my! Goodness. Maybe he adopted. I don't know. Stop it. I don't know. Shout out to Dingo, my buddy. Shout out. To, no, that's can, right. I'm going to cancel. And Dingo I'm Jr. canceling that. Di shout out to what? Dingo. You canceled it. Yeah, that's right. I'm can, I'm rescinding it because I can do that. Unbelievable. So this is a really good question. Uh, R. J. Krasinski asks, "Who would win in a fight?" James Ellworth, Ellsworth, or Dingo? <laughs> That's not a real question. Uh, That's not a real. No, question. it's re it's re you know what? It's still real to me. No, and no, because Dingo, I can't even. You know, like every time you say the name Dingo, like a, 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 a little bird dies and falls out of a tree. Dingo's a big dude, man. Please, and let me tell you something. Dingo's a big dude. He is a tough customer. I'm sure his cholesterol numbers are pretty big. <laughs> From e eating all those Cheetos and drinking the big, big gulps and tweeting all day. You know what he calls you? I don't know the, because I don't pay attention to the him. Boston bad bully. And I'm starting oh, to think wah. he might have a point. There, okay? I'm starting to think he might have a Dingo point. I think Dingo might need to okay? go to a safe space. No. And I think that safe space no. might be in he his mother's basement. He doesn't need safety. Dingo is a man that lives by his own Let rules. me just tell Dingo one thing. Rebel with a R.J. Cause. Krasinski handles my light work. Oh, okay? stop it. And other, other it, than that, it's, he doesn't need to worry about it. It's disrespectful. Just so you know. It's disrespectful. You know what's disrespectful? Okay. It's disrespectful for a man, a grown man, yeah. to call himself Dingo. Whoa. That's disrespectful to, the, to men. Listen. That's disrespectful to... He had to... a dog. No, Don't go after the man's dog. He, he's well, told you that before. What if his dog was named Old Yeller? Was he going to call himself Old Yeller? Sure. He probably I mean, should have, <laughs> because Dingo should be, you know, at the end, for the good of everyone, we might have to, take, just, him out, we have to take him out the back 40 it's just terrible. and just take care of him. It's just to put him, put him out of his misery you know, and our misery. It's, I think that's what needs to happen. You got a, you got a perfectly nice guy, and you oh, just continue nice to guy, run my him ass. down. It just, it's unbelievable. Please. It's unbelievable. You know, you got me all riled up here. I was ready yeah. to have a nice, slow, nice ending of the show, and you got me all talking about this. And it, it, it made me think, because I want to go back to what we were talking about a minute ago, which was actual wrestling related, not like Dingo and his bizarre obsessions. I like obsessions. talking about Dingo, by the way. Talking about Sasha Banks. And let me tell you something. Brother, and have I got a lot of material to crack on tonight. Oh, boy. All right. Oh, I, my again, Buddha. I'll let Rick yeah. do my light work for me here. Wow. I got a lot of material to crack on tonight because it occurred to me when you were talking about Sasha. Because I didn't even realize until 
you said it, that this 203 thing, 205 thing, whatever it's called, two, what a stupid name anyway. Well, I can't even remember, 203, 205. Because everyone in it is two, 205 pounds or under. Who gives a S? Oh. I, who, why, who cares? Come up with a good name. Again, creatively bankrupt. Unbelievable. As I've been saying for months now. No. No, you haven't. We, so we're you not get someone to... like Sasha Banks, who is a talent, premier talent. She is. She's okay. the boss. She's the boss. Right. And she's been featured huge. Huge. That's right. Bigly. Yep. She's been featured bigly in the past year, especially. Put on top. Yeah. Has done very well. Fans love it. They eat it up. They spend money. Like me. Sure. Fans like you. Yeah. An unabashed and fan. And Caitlin. Shout out to Caitlin. Biggest fan. Right. Oh, that's right. Uh, the, yeah. the wedding, right? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So, right. So, here it is. That's, that's fandom. Okay. So, you take someone like her. You slap together this 209, whatever the hell it is, 205. It doesn't do well because no one gives a shit about the cruiserweights right now. Stop it right now. They, they don't because it's, it. they treat it like it's third tier, so it is third tier. Okay. And now what do they want to do? Some sort of half-assed band-aid by taking somebody who's on top, who has some momentum, and, and lowering them into the well and hoping that they pull some water up with them when they come back up. Explain to me. Now, you defended this, which I knew, when, as soon as you defended this, I knew it was abnormal because you like Sasha Banks. But I know that you were under the Manchurian candidate-like control of Vince McMahon. Unbelievable. So you have to agree by some sort of contract you signed. Unbelievable. It makes no sense. This 205 thing is a, is a bastard child of the WWE. It's the worst ratings. It's got to be. I, we've talked about this before. It's... It, they they tank. Tell me they do. Tell me they do better they than don't tank. They tank, but they two hundred five live is something that they're still working on. All right, they're trying to tweak the formula, trying to figure out <sighs> yeah, what they, they can put out there it. to to gain. No, they're not more this attention. Is, you know what? Tweet. This is tweaking. They think that taking a, a star who was a person who at least one match considered a match of the year for the past three years, they're going to just plop her in there. And it's going to somehow magically bring well, viewers? Hey, if you got somebody who's putting on matches of the year every year for the past no. three years, no. then why not no. have them be featured Because it's a throwaway your... of talent. It's a throwaway of well, talent. It's a waste of time. Come on. Because here's the thing. A wrestler's career is, a, is essentially finite. As they get older, they, they just can't do it. Uh, some of the wrestlers, we know, they're still doing it. But they're not working at that level. And you're taking a slice of her finite career and dumping it on a dumping ground. Stop it, This is, starts to fit. This this is the pattern emerging again no. from Vince McMahon no, you're and not company. Gonna, you're not it's the start, pattern that emerges you're not gonna all start the with time. That again. You're not going to start with that again. There was nothing wrong with giving us more Sasha Banks. What if okay? she gets injured in a, one of these stupid 205 things? She's not going to get injured. What if she does, man. though? It ha but, you, you don't know that well, for then, sure. Hey, that's part of the business. Oh, oh, oh what hey, do you mean? it's part of the business. When she should have been working on her form and, and working in where she belongs with, with the higher-ups, the true professionals, at the true top-tier level, you're going to throw her down there? To hope to gather some ratings for some other folks that no one cares about. Come on, man! You're gonna bleed off her publicity. You're gonna bleed off her fame, her fandom. You're trying That's to just what you're supposed to do. No, you're supposed to encourage it to make more money. What this is is Vince once again showing contempt for the fans of his own product. You're kidding it's me! It's right absolutely now. asinine. You're, and the reason really it, it's either right senility now. or he's completely lost focus on what he's trying to do. You're kidding we me! We know right that now. the creative end doesn't work. But I'm telling you, this isn't working either. You take an established star that you know is over, right? And you and you put other stars that you're trying to get over with them, mm -hmm. and they will. Yeah. The, you know, the oh, they'll cream, get over. Yeah, like Daniel over. Bryan, like, uh, uh, like Mick Foley, who were, these guys were basically tortured to their careers were tortured to death. They're, they're locked into these unwinnable. You're going to take Sasha Banks in her prime, beat her up, you so that, and then you're going to make her a loser. Stop. It. You're going to make her a loser Stop so it. she can't go and make a career somewhere else. Stop it. I, I'm going to go further and say that she's probably not going to be on the main card for the pay-per-view. Come on. Well, because they're setting it up. Think about it. They're setting it up. That's not been, uh, pre not been determined yet. Pre-show. No, 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 they're no, gonna no, no. They're going to kick her to the pre-show because she's getting too big no. for her good-looking britches. That's and that. Vince McMahon can't take this it because he doesn't like his fans. That man is so full of self-loathing right that now. he cannot let someone get Anywhere o o more over than him. Vince McMahon, I beg of you, 
please do not put Sasha Banks on the pre-show. If it happens, for extreme oh rules. my god, I because, can't wait. No, no, if it happens, I don't think that's going to happen. You thought your loss way. to Babam was going to be huge. No. If that happens, and I'm right because no. that's uh, that th- those are the tea leaves I'm reading. No, because of the no. way she's being treated, I, you are never going to live that one down. I don't think down. that's going to because happen. you say, you call yourself a fan of this person, and you're going to allow Vince McMahon to kick it around, and you're just going to go along with it. Are you kidding me? Right, you're just going to go along with there's, it. Listen, there's the no, hell's wrong. There's with you. nothing wrong with the way that they have been featuring her helping out 205 Live. At least she's on the pay-per-view, and I think that she's going to be perfectly fine. She's got a good match going on. It's a mixed tag yeah. match. You know what it is? It's and the chant. It's the We Want Sasha chant, okay? It pissed off Vince McMahon, and you know it, because he wants people chanting his name. No. He's completely no. nuts. No. He's lost it. So you know no. what's going to happen? No. This is the very beginning of a very long slide for yeah. her. Yeah, you have the inside scoop now, right? Think you know about, everything that's going to happen. Oh, no, I look at history. I look at history. I look at what happened to Daniel Bryan. Where, and, and even guys like John Cena, when they start to get too big, what do we do? We start having these goofy storylines, emasculating them, this and that. You're going to take someone like Sasha Banks. You're going to, oh, we're going to, we're going to kick her over here to help with the ratings. Uh, you know, we're going to move her to the pre-show. I've seen a lot of great bands in my life. I've seen Eric Clapton. I've seen The Who. I've seen a lot of big classic, big bands. Uh, let me name all the all the the opening acts I remember. Uh, exactly zero. Oh my! Because goodness. they were nobody. Sasha Banks is not an nobody. opening act. You stop that right well, now. I agree with you. I like agree that. with you. No. But that's where she's going to be no. because Vince can't stand her getting any bigger. And this may be the decline of Sasha Banks into obscurity, where he's going to make her sit home, or she's going to get injured and have to sit out the rest of her contract, and he'll move on to that's bigger, it. better I'm things. Done. No, I'm done. No, I'm not done. I'm done. I'm, I'm not done. done because when you start talking about Sasha Banks, when you start talking about Vince McMahon, and you make all these disparaging remarks. I just, I can't take it, man, because it's just because not truth, right. No, because no, it's you not know, right. Hi- Listen, you, no okay. one knows wrestling history better than you, yeah. and you have to agree with me that he's done this before, and this is he the has, exact same pattern emerging. No, and he's done it, he, and he'll do it again. He's you're not, not going to do. Stop. He's going to keep I'm it going. With this, this guy. is this is all he knows how uh, to do. No. He can't be creative. You're, you got to be kidding me, right? So now, now he's just being vindictive. Thank you to Royal Goblin Films for joining us today. Folks, you can head over to Facebook and Twitter. Type in Duke Loves Wrestling. Let us know what you think. All of our previous episodes are on YouTube. I got to get out of here because this guy is just so disrespectful you. towards you know, it's, Vince it's McMahon. Crazy. You're you know, bringing up Sasha Banks. You're putting is out this negative energy.